Hello, BookTube. Well, we're continuing to trek on with Boldly Govember. Boldly Govember is a an easy flip and read along created by Matt at Paperback Junkie, uh, in which all you have to do to participate is read a Star Trek book in the month of November. Any kind of Star Trek book, fiction, nonfiction, pictures, anything, uh, and boom. You've participated in Boldly Govember. That's all I needed to do, which means I, that I was done on day one. <laughs> but but I have continued to make videos. I don't, uh, as of today, I don't see anybody making any Boldly Govember videos, including the guy who created the readathon. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I need precious little in the way of excuse to talk about Star Trek. I love Star Trek, and I have read the books forever, forever. And reread them, gone back to them forever and ever, uh, and watched trends in them. I've watched them change over time as they become more institutionalized, as they become more authorized, as they become more lawyer watched, uh, as the the show became more of a, a franchise property. The original movie, Star Trek: The Motion Picture, was a moonshot. It was, it was a bunch of people in Hyatt Regencies across the country telling studio executives and studio representatives that uh, basically if you build it, they will come. If you make a big movie of Star Trek, believe it or not, although in, uh, yesterday you hadn't heard of this thing that showed up on TV for three years and is gone, if you make a big movie, fans will make that movie a success. A lot of people at the, at the studio had to be convinced of that, and a lot of them didn't believe it until the money started coming in. Uh, and then they realized, okay, there's something to this. There, There is a fan base here, and there, there, this is therefore a viable property. Books were coming out the whole time. Adaptations of, of the original tele screenplays, adaptations by Alan Dean Foster of the, the animated series, in which over the course of adapting the scripts for the animated cartoons, most of which were terrible. <laughs> most of the scripts for those 20-minute cartoons were terrible. One of them was written by the great D.C. Fontana, and it was wonderful yesteryear. But most of them were terrible and derivative, incredibly derivative of the original three seasons of Star Trek. And yet, as Alan Dean Foster, a classic old science fiction hack, he was given the brief to write them in book form, and as he did that, they got longer. <laughs> His adaptations got longer as he just started filling in material, and fans loved it. They couldn't get enough of it. Little, I, mean, I mean, imagine it. It had never happened before. You write a book adapting the screenplay of a cartoon that was in itself an adaptation of a canceled science fiction series, and it sells millions of copies. That had never happened before. No one knew what to do with that. And that, keep in mind was already showing some people at Paramount that this property would make tons of money, movie or no movie. But once the movies came, everything changed. All of a sudden, you have an official continuity again. All of a sudden, you have things that are canon. All of a sudden, you have a first movie, and it does reasonably well, and there's all sorts of new movie viewing technology right on the horizon, and you know that you're going to be able to make the most of that. So you're not worried about the movie breaking even or making you money. And then, after a little while, a second movie came out, and Star Trek II was a very different thing from Star Trek, the motion picture. Star Trek II wanted to tell a story. It wanted to thrill you. It wanted to call back the original show in a far more explicit manner than Star Trek, the motion picture. In Star Trek, the motion picture, there are callbacks to the original show, but they're very subtle. If you don't know the original show, you will never guess from the movie that Captain Will Decker, the young man who is Kirk's protege, is the son of a Commodore in a great old Star Trek episode, Matt Decker. You won't know that uh, unless you know that. <laughs> Whereas in the second movie, the original show is called back explicitly <laughs> because a great villain from the original show is brought back, played by the same actor. And uh, the second movie had a great director, Heck of a guy. Went to a great school. <laughs> right there in the middle of the Midwest. Uh, and doesn't let up. Star Trek II is, is an utterly fantastic adventure movie. And started the, what I think is unfair, uh, sort of unofficial rubric for Star Trek movies that the even number ones are always good. <laughs> I think Star Trek The Motion Picture is, is very good. It's just a very different kind of movie. And of course, Star Trek Three, which is an odd-numbered movie, is my favorite Star Trek movie. And I've seen it 35 times in the theater. I watched it 35 times in the course of a whole summer. I would sometimes spend the whole day in the movie theater <laughs> until I knew everything, until I knew every word of it. Uh, but uh, once Star Trek II hit the theaters and 
fans were starting to talk about it. But not only that, non-fans were going to see it because it was just so entertaining. Because because the director, blessed to be his name, had decided, hey, these characters are fascinating. This whole world is fascinating. Why why make something as stately homage like the first movie when I can bring back the sense of adventure that made this thing thrilling to begin with? Once that started to happen, once there was a successful second movie, once the sights were set on a successful third movie, once there was talk and then the reality of a new TV show, an ongoing TV show, then there was serious money involved. And once that happened, the books got tighter scrutiny, uh, which we saw last time. We, we, we started to see the tiny increase of that. But another thing that we mentioned last time is that because Star Trek The Motion Picture takes place 2.73 years after the end of the original show, Actual time has passed. Kirk has been promoted. Most of his original crew has been promoted. They have started, they've gone on with their lives, and we haven't seen it. They haven't been confined to this little ship. And then in Star Trek II, there's even more passage of time and even more changes. Uh, and age, for the first time in, uh, in Star Trek II, becomes an issue. Time is actually commented on. Saving the galaxy is a job for the young. Says Jim Kirk, of all people. And uh, the, the repost right there on screen is, what the hell is that supposed to mean? <laughs> uh, and not only that, but Star Trek II gives us the return of an old villain and the appearance of a son to Jim Kirk, who's a grown man. It introduces, it, Star Trek II cements what we talked about last time, which is that suddenly in this fictional property, time is an issue. Time is involved. It, it isn't that the studio decided when they were making Star Trek The Motion Picture, we're going to make a two-hour movie about the Starship Enterprise. We're going to recast everybody. We're going to give it a young cast. It'll be the same names. Plenty of people have done that. And we're just going to have a series of movies in which they have adventures. No, they decided not to do that. They decided instead to introduce the passage of real time into a fictional universe. And then just kept upping the ante. Star Trek Two introduces the passage of even more real time. Naturally, that gets reflected in the books. Naturally, all of a sudden, when you're writing a book, you have a choice of when to set it, not just where to set it. It's not just that you're writing a Star Trek novel, you also have to specify when you're writing your Star Trek novel. Is it taking place in the original five-year mission? Is it taking place in the second five-year mission? Is it taking place in the exact time continuity of Star Trek II? Or what about right before Star Trek Three, Are you writing a, no a Star Trek novel in which Spock is dead? Or what about right after Star Trek IV, when Earth is recovering from almost being destroyed by an alien probe of unimaginable power? Do you do it then? And if so, are you writing about repercussions, or are you setting it, the adventure somewhere else? Some, somehow else? Where are these characters in their lives, in addition to in their adventures? Star Trek novelists all of a sudden had to deal with that. Uh, and the novel that we're seeing today uh, deals with it explicitly. It's Margaret Wander Bonanno's Strangers from the Sky, one of the, the so-called giant Star Trek novels. This one with a Boris Vallejo cover. There is the Enterprise. There is our crew uh, and a mysterious Vulcan woman. And also there's a lovely ste step back that's just, that's just the artwork. Uh, and this book very carefully tells you at the beginning the time periods of Star Trek continuity in which it takes place. <laughs> Let me see if I can uh, if I can give you that. There's a note, uh, historian's note. <laughs> Strangers from the Sky encompasses two different eras in the lives of Kirk and Spock. Book one, part the first part of the book, begins with those nebulous years between the Enterprise's encounter with V'ger in Star Trek: The Motion Picture and the death of Spock in The Wrath of Khan. Book two focuses on a younger James T. Kirk, newly in command, and his Vulcan first officer, not yet quite his friend, in a time just prior to the first season television episode, Where No Man Has Gone Before. Uh, the, this episode first introduced Gary Mitchell, Lee Kelso, Dr. Elizabeth Daner, and the reader may wish to use it as a reference. See what I mean? All of a sudden, this is more complicated. All of a sudden, you need to know when this is taking place. Uh, although... In deference to, to Margaret Wander Bonanno, I should point out that you don't really need to know any of that in the course of reading this book. Uh, because she handles it perfectly. That note may be there as a precaution 
you know, but again, it was probably mandated by an editor. Her book itself doesn't present any problems in understanding continuity or time passage or time periods or anything of the kind. Uh, and the main story uh, revolves around a book called Strangers from the Sky that is sweeping many worlds in the 23rd century. McCoy can't stop reading it. Everyone's reading it. Everyone's talking about it. Because it puts forward an alternate uh, version of history. It takes the official story of Earth's first contact with aliens, uh, which in this book is set uh, uh, for Alpha Centauri. It, it, this book was, was written, of course, long before Star Trek First Contact. So none of that, that was all made later. This was going on much earlier Star Trek stuff. Not a lot of it uh, included in the show. A lot of this stems from fan discussion, from fan fiction, from novels that, that weren't ever published and stuff like that. Uh, and mankind has a settled first contact history. They first met, they travel to Alpha Centauri, they meet aliens who look just like humans, and that makes their entrance into the world of aliens much softer. And it's, it's only 20 or 30 years later that they meet Vulcans for the first time. And the novel, Strangers from the Sky, <clears throat> which is inside the book called Strangers in the Sk from the Sky, the novel that McCoy is reading and wants Kirk to read, uh, tells a completely different story. Tells the story of a Vulcan, of a Vulcan craft that was disabled and crash landed on Earth, and made first contact with humans then, not when the official history books say so. And Kirk is disdainful; he likes his official history, but the the mention of that plot line and the 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 fact that everybody he knows is reading Strangers from the Sky suddenly makes him have flashes of almost memory, almost a dreamlike memory of events connected with the events chronicled in Strangers from the Sky. And he finds out that Spock is having those same dreams. It it speaks to uh, memory suppression, an alternate reality, perhaps even an alternate historical timeline, and the novel digs into that. Our, our cast splits into different time periods, not just the two that are mentioned at the beginning of this book, but a third. Uh, and there's a, an extensive cast of human characters on Earth, all of whom have clearly delineated motives of their own when it comes to reacting to the appearance of aliens with green blood on Earth. Also, uh, we get a lot from the viewpoint of that Vulcan crew, the survivors of it. The, 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 most of the crew is killed in the crash, but there are survivors, and we get a lot of their viewpoints too. And in a perfectly orchestrated multi-strand plot. The book works its way to a conclusion about what actually happened and why, at the beginning of the book, lots of people remember lots of different things. I don't want to give it away. I don't want to spoil the book. And if you talk about events that take place even, I'd say, probably 110 pages in, you will suddenly be spoiling the book. It is that, it's that well constructed. Things keep you gripped right from the beginning and just keep happening. Uh, but this is the, the the details of the plot don't so much matter uh, for this discussion here. What, what, what I want to talk about here today is that not only is this book uh, a terrific story, multi-layered and whatnot, but you remember I've said that there are two reasons to come to a Star Trek, to a Star Trek novel, Star Trek fiction. I've said the same reason that we go to Star Trek any version of Star Trek, even a filmed version of Star Trek. The reason we go to it is for two reasons. One is the gee whiz, wild bang, uh, pseudoscientific stuff that happens. Alien whales, uh, mating rituals in humanoid species, that sort of thing. Uh, and the other is to see Star Trek done right. To see our characters done right. In character and yet facing uh, circumstances that we never saw them face in the original show. That is a joy that you, you really have to experience it to know what I'm talking about, but to see your characters done right, it just makes you cheer as a fan. And the longer a fan you are, the more you will cheer for it. Uh, and you'll notice every time in every video where I've said that, that those are the reasons we come to Star Trek fiction, I've left out one thing. There's one thing that I haven't talked about when I talk about Star Trek fiction. And that's uh, would ordinarily be one of the first things I would talk about as a reason to come to a kind of fiction. And that would be because it's good. <laughs> You'll notice that I've said I really love books, but they're cheesy. I've said I have a soft spot for them, but they're they're incredibly flawed. I've said that that uh, you know the James Blish uh, 
TV show adaptations scratched and itched. They were all we had. I've said all sorts of things like that. I've talked about the, the sense of camaraderie that all of us had passing around our own dot matrix, uh, you know, home written stories about the Gorn or, or, uh, Flint or whatever. The one thing I haven't mentioned is that the books were any good <laughs> as books, just as books, even if you don't know Star Trek. Uh, and the reason why I haven't said that is because they haven't been. <laughs> they aren't. They're mostly horrible. If you take away all of those elements, the whiz-bang stuff can't just be whiz-bang if you're writing a standalone science fiction novel, obviously, or you'd be mocked right off the stage. And getting our characters right is a specific thing to Star Trek. It applies if you loved the original show. You're not going to care otherwise. Uh and if you take those elements out of all the Star Trek novels that I've mentioned, there's not much left. <laughs> there's, a, there's overheated boilerplate prose and not much else. Until you get to this book. This, Strangers from the Sky, is the very first Star Trek novel that's actually a good novel. I don't think that any Star Trek fan was waiting for that. I don't think we would have begrudged if we'd gone all this time without one. It, certainly when I read this, I was halfway through it, and I was thinking something was nagging at me while I was reading. I was thinking, "This is fascinating. This is this is really really good." The not only are my characters, quote unquote, my characters perfectly in character, but I'm loving all the other characters. Uh, and then I was about halfway through, and I suddenly realized, you know, I know what it is that's bothering about this thing. This is actually really good. <laughs> I could hand this to somebody who doesn't know anything about Star Trek, and they would read it to the end <laughs> and really like it. You might, think, you might think that's a very small accomplishment. But nevertheless, Star Trek had never done it before this book. And here it is. <laughs> and that introduces a whole new uh, element into Star Trek fiction in our ongoing boring discussion here, which is that some of them will actually be good books. An extra feat on the, on the, laid on the shoulders of these authors. First of all, the author has to get their... Uh, plot pitch passed a whole bunch more people than they ever did. Once upon a time, it was an agent or a reading editor at Paramount. Now, by the time this book came out, it's a whole legion of people, and they all have their inputs. They all have things they want to tell you to do, and you have to do it because this is an authorized product. You're being you're being paid, but this is being put up on the big screen and soon on the small screen, and it has to be right. You can't be taking liberties with our official property, or we'll sue you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge burden on its own, added to the G whiz factor and also getting the characters right, which is no small thing on its own. Now, in addition to all of that, it's also possible if a writer really tries, is lucky, is passionate enough, that they can write a good novel on top of all that. So don't get used to it. Obviously, as you can tell from that list of, of uh, prerequisites, it's really hard to do. There aren't many novels, there aren't many Star Trek novels that, are, that actually carry their weight outside of fandom. This is one of them. Uh, and I, I reread it once again for Boldly November and was even more impressed. It, it, the, it has multiple narrative frames, that, the strands that run throughout it, and they're all perfectly handled. And the, the ending of the book is just a cascade of revelations and ratcheting up of tension in a way that just makes it impossible to stop reading. I just, I, I loved it. I loved it even more than I was expecting to love it. So that's our Star Trek novel for today, and it gets five triples out of five. <laughs> it's the very first Star Trek novel we've touched that did. And again, you shouldn't expect this <laughs> in the future. Uh, the, the previous Star, giant Star Trek novel, for instance, was a book called Enterprise uh, that uh, is by one of my favorite Star Trek writers, and that has some really good moments, but it fails as a novel. It falls apart in the halfway mark and never recollects itself, unfortunately. So you have lots and lots of interesting things, but they're not brought into th this kind of tight focus, not anywhere close to it. Uh, so <laughs> so this particular installment of Boldly Govember has a, a little bit of a new wrinkle, which is that I get to recommend this book. <laughs> <laughs> book recommendations haven't really factored in because fans are going to read it anyway and non-fans aren't invited. <laughs> you, aren't, you aren't involved in any way. But this, I actually recommend uh, as a Star Trek novel and also as a novel. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to wrap this up for here. It was a tremendous joy to reread this.
uh, for for boldly November, and we'll move on next time and hope that we have that our luck continues. That <laughs> we still have great stuff to talk about. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'll I'll wrap this up for now. But I'll see you then. Thank you, Booktube.